not likely to spend a few minutes to talk about my background and um, and um, so forth. You want me to get, go into that? Uh, no. People know why I'm here. Time. No, we know all about you. Okay. All right. Let's get let's get into where we're at with this. First of all, Congressional District Four is a new district. It's a district that was created at the last, after the last census, and it encompasses all of North Las Vegas to the end of the state and the middle part of the state. When they drew this district up, they drew this up feeling that this would be a safe seat for Senator Horsford. This is an in-state Senate district. It has a higher proportion of African Americans in the district, and uh, the district is about 10% more Democrats now. It goes between 9 and 10% more. Uh, before I got into this race, you know, I wanted to make sure this was a viable race I could win. I looked at it, I, and you look at some of the numbers are misleading. Uh, President Bush won this district in 04 for president, obviously. Uh, Governor Gibbons lost this district by one tenth of one percent in 06, and Sandoval won this district by eight percent. So that being said, a, a good, strong candidate on the Republican ticket can win this dis this district. Um, I felt this district was. Uh, made, uh, fitted me very, very well. First of all, a lot of uh, the urban part of, of this district in Clark County is old Las Vegas, people that know my family and myself. Uh, and then it also, also encompasses the middle part of the state, which my family and I have um, spent a lot of time here since 2006, whether it was campaigning or even going back and off here, uh, enjoying the uh, different family activities that you have, we're taking our kids to a number of parades, fairs, and so forth. We've established a good, strong base of people there. And in fact, in the primary, it was rural Nevada that won the race for me. I won rural Nevada by 70% of the vote. So with this race going to the general election, we all understand Horford is going to win Clark County. The question is by how much will he win that by? If I can keep the race close enough and then do real well in rural Nevada, and I include here in Overton as part of rural Nevada, even though they count this as Clark County in the, uh, when they talk about the districts. If I can do real strong in rural Nevada, home owner Clark County, we win this race. And I, Work is very hard out there, and I'm counting on the support of people like yourselves to not only get out and vote for me, but get enough people registered and other people out there to vote, talk into the soft Democrats, the independents that understand uh, what's really important in our country right now, and getting them out to vote and make it a difference so we can overcome the voter registration that's out there in urban Nevada. There is a clear difference between myself and uh, uh, Stephen Horst, but I don't think this race will be determined upon um, my new differences between the candidates. Stephen Borsford was President Obama's 2008 uh, pr uh, chairman of his presidential campaign here in the state of Nevada. He's been a delegate for the National Party, an ardent supporter of uh, a national delegate for the, the Democrat Party, an ardent supporter of every single uh, bill that's been uh, uh, um, uh, voted on and passed by, on President Obama's uh, campaign or his, his, his administration. He's going to be a rubber stamp for what Obama's done, and if you like where Obama has taken the country, then, he, then, then you should vote for him or anybody who uh, feels that we should vote for him. I believe the vast majority of Americans do not believe that. Even some that may vote for Obama don't believe in the policies that he's espousing and wants to take our country, and I would assume most of you don't either. Uh, I believe that our, our government, the, the, the federal government, uh, was created for a few limited purposes. And as a representative of the federal government, we should do everything we can to do those purposes as best as we can and, and, and get out of the business of everything else. Uh, my father used to say when he was a basketball coach that he wanted to do his team to do one or two things and do them great, and he'd love to play against a team that did five or six things because he couldn't do any of them very well. In my opinion, that's what's happened to our federal government. We have a constitution that delineates what responsibilities are supposed to do, and instead of doing those things great, we're trying to solve all the social ills, and the latest example has been the health care uh, bill that was passed. You know, the health care, education, and welfare should be left up to the states. Those are the states' responsibility, not the federal government. And that's one reason why we're in the mess we're in. So I believe in a limited, smaller government. I believe in a lower tax base of what we're facing right now, and I believe in less government spending, and I believe in uh, protecting our personal freedoms and liberties uh, that were guaranteed to us through the Constitution. Uh, Horsford will uh, take the position of virtually every, uh, every office of every one of those. So there's a clear distinction. The question is going to be who can get the voters out to the polls uh, enough to win uh, in a district that was uh, drawn up for a Democrat. Now, I believe this district is ground zero in the whole country. Uh, we are facing a, a a crisis in our country in which way we're going to go. Obama's socialistic policies or Governor Romney's free market principles. And here in District 4, if we can win this congressional seat, I believe we'll get a whole Congress. 
if we win this congressional seat, I guarantee you that Senator Heller is going to win a, a Nevada, and we can very well take over the Senate. And if we win this congressional seat, we have a great chance of winning Nevada for Governor Romney, and he may win the presidency. So we have a big, big impact we could have here at this district, and I'm counting on each and every one of you to help be a part of that. That being said, I'd like to take any questions you have and answer anything more specific that you may have. Can you give us a little of your history? A few of us are still here. Sure. Area. I moved to Nevada when I was very young. I was 11. I went to high school in Las Vegas, Gorman High School. Went to UNLV. Actually, I went to school in Dixie for my first year. I uh, went to Dixie College, Dixie Junior College at the time. Went back to Las Vegas, uh, graduated from UNLV. I played on my father's first number one ranked team in UNLV's history, which is a very proud accomplishment on my part. Graduated, graduated from UNLV uh, as a Rose, first school's first Rose Scholar candidate, two-time academic All-American. Went to law school, University of San Diego School of Law. Graduated third of my class, magna cum laude. Came back to Las Vegas. I practiced law for seven years. When my father got the head coaching position at Fresno State, it was his last uh, job he was going to have there. And since I had played for him there, I decided to go and finish out his coaching career there. So I coached with him as his assistant for, until 2002. Met my wife Amy there. We've been married 10 years. My youngest son Jared is here. You want to wait, Jared? Can you say hi? <laughs> Jared's, two and, Jared's two and a half. I have a nine-year-old daughter named Lois and twin daughters, Ava and Ashley. Uh, when I came back to Las Vegas, I started a nonprofit uh, Tarkane and Basketball Academy, which is built into a sports facility now. Well, we work with young kids and teach them not just the, the fundamentals you learn playing sports, but what I believe the life skills that you should learn playing sports that I believe has carried over to everything I've done professionally and has helped me be successful. Being able to compete, handle adversity, uh, deal with uh, teammates, take pressure from the coaches, a litany of things that we try to teach young kids. I also started a real estate company that we developed uh, a uh, real estate commercial center that we're still trying to lease up in a very difficult times in Las Vegas, but we're one of the few that are still around and so far hanging on by our nails. Um, and uh, I ran uh, in 2004 for the state senate. I uh, lost to, uh, in that race, in a district that was 18.5% more Democrats. Uh, we lost by 7%. Um, in that race, uh, my opponent, when the race was tightened up and looked like I might beat him, came out and said some things that were not politically spin, but actual complete falsehood, saying I was involved in certain things. I was the first political person ever to go to court and win a defamation lawsuit and set the record straight. Um, I lost the 2006 uh, Secretary of State race to Governor Miller's son in a close race, ran in the 2010 U.S. Senate race against Sharon Angle and, and Sue Loud in the primary, and lost to uh, Sue Loud in, uh, in that race. Uh, so now I'm here. I could have quit. The easy, what, easy thing to do after that, difficult and heartbreaking loss in the Senate race, was to step aside and walk away. But my father has, has, uh, has taught me that if you want to continue to do something you really care about, you don't quit, but you also don't just jump into something. You learn about of your mistakes and become better at it and become a tougher candidate. I've tried to do that. If anybody watched my previous races, they will see that I'm a better speaker in public. I've done better with commercials. I've tried to work on my debating skills. I've done better on that. Uh, I didn't just jump into this race uh, haphazardly. I've worked very hard to get to where I'm at right now. I believe that's one reason why I won the primary in a very tough race. I'm sorry about that. Yes. How do you feel about securing the borders, and what are we going to do about the illegal alien problem in Nevada? Um, in Nevada, in the country. Well, first of all, I've, I've been attacked by Stephen Horster for being too far going against immigration. I've never wavered on it at all. We need to secure borders for national security purposes, also for immigration purposes. We have a country of rule of laws, and we have laws of how people can come in the country legally and uh, they should be enforced. When people come into the country illegally, they're not entitled to taxpayer benefits. I don't believe they should be provided. Employers are not entitled to hire people that are here illegally. We should go after employers that do so. Um, and at the same time, we need to revise the INS laws that are out there right now and make it easier and quicker for people that want to come into the country legally to file the right paperwork, go through the procedure, and come into our country when jobs are needed for them to work at. Uh, there's a four-step process, and I think the fourth one is just as important as the other three. Uh, will, excuse me, just one more. Um, will you work to enforce e-verify in the state of Nevada? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's the, what we talked about going after the employers who will hire people legal and that's e-verification. 
yes, I believe we, we need to enforce that uh, okay. and make it uh, even more efficient so that uh, there are less mistakes and we can hold uh, uh, the employers more accountable. I'd like to ask you what you know about von Mises and Austrian economics, and then specifically, what's your position on the energy problem we have in this country? First one, uh, I didn't hear the first word, and I heard Austrian economics. Von Mises. Okay, I, I'm not. I, no, I he's know. the father of Austrian economics. So what do you know about Austrian economics? Well, there's. I, I'm not sure if that's the free market part or if that's the one that Obama was following. I'm a little confused. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. Okay. You need to read about the Austrian economics because it's the only system that supports. Capitalistic societies. Okay. So and it it's the free market. Work. It's the free market principles that we have worked on and have had the greatest economic success in the history of, of mankind. And so, one that I talk about, I espouse, and it's the ones that obviously my opponent is not in favor of. I'll learn the terminology a little better. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Now, uh, I'm sorry. How about yeah. power? Uh, I mean, energy. Yeah. Uh, one of the big things that we can do, and I don't see how anybody can be against it. Is, is to become energy independent here in our country with the resources that we have available to us. I believe that every state should have the opportunity to explore, produce, and, uh, and sell uh, whatever energy products they have if the state wants to do so. I don't think we should force upon state things that they don't want to have. So, for example, North Dakota is one of the most prosperous states in the country right now with the lowest unemployment. It's taking advantage of the shell oil and gas reserves that are found in this state. We should encourage those type of things. If uh, Alaska wants to drill in Anwa, they, we should we should uh, we should encourage those type of things. There are enough gas reserves in the United States to supply us with 200 years of energy, including uh, energy to uh, 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 motorized vehicles. Uh, they there are things that use them with uh, methanol and other type of products that they can use with gas that can take away their reliance upon oil if you wanted to go away from there. Although there still is an abundance of oil here in the country, we should refine it. At the same time that we're using these energies that uh, we can become energy independent on here in our country at a low cost, we need to continue to do research and development on the green energies. Why? But we need to put, we don't want to put the cart before the horse, which is what Obama's Why? done. We're trying to force green energy down our throats now, but it's four to eight times more expensive in an economy yeah. that can't afford it, that needs yeah. jobs. But instead, we should be working on trying to get those type of products better produced at lower cost, which we are able to do through our innovations that we've had here in our country. So I'm all in favor of uh, utilizing all of the resources of the energy that we have available now, which is gas, oil, geothermal, nuclear, uh, and keeping the cost down to become an energy independent. It would create millions of jobs here in the country, billions of dollars in tax revenue, and keep the revenues that were sent over to the Middle East here in the United States, which would help our national security, and at the same time work on the research and development of green energies. I'm sorry, you're going to follow this on. That's good. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll get is, you next, is, I'm sorry. Is part of the issue the amount of land the federal government owns in our state and no. other states the, the, also? The biggest problems that we have right now are the oh, regulations, okay. the way they're being passed and interpreted by the, the EPA, uh, the Endangered Species Act, and those type of things. For government and, land or private? Uh, well, the, the private land, you, you have to still go through the EPA process which you're able to do a little quicker than you do on government land. Uh, but still, when they won't allow uh, you to um, build pipes uh, for the, to, to, to uh, transport the gas, uh, they're, they're cutting off one of the main uh, sources of, of, of energy that we can have. And because of environmental issues, uh, they are cutting off more and more areas that we can do that along with the areas of exploration. You know, we've always been a country that swings on pendulums. You know, one time we were very protective of the employers. Uh, and, and not protect it all against the environment. We would swung, instead of coming to a nice equilibrium where you protect the employer ease and the environment at the same time, you take into consideration the importance of what that product is that you're trying to utilize. We've swung the whole other way now. We're taking care of the environment and, uh, and to some degree, employees to such an extent we're stranglehold our businesses from being able to compete, expand, and be um, competitive in this in this international environment right now. We have to get back to a, a more balanced equilibrium. So, from some of your comments, I get the impression that you would like to cut the size of government. I assume that also includes cutting its budget. Yeah. How will you answer your opponents who will say that you're throwing granny under the bus? You don't like poor people. You hate uh, you're racist, and you um, 
You have absolutely no compassion. Okay, first of all, they're talking about, this shows how crazy our country is right now in, in the budget talks. They're talking about, hey, we got to, we got to pass uh, $500 billion in tax uh, cuts over the next 10 years or there's going to be this uh, fiscal cliff that we're going to fall off of. I'll tell you how we can save 60 some billion a year without anybody in the country disagreeing with this. I, I, I even think Harry Reid would have to agree with him. He's being honest with everybody. But first, first of all, first of all, you cut the 18 billion dollars we provide in, in pork projects, not projects that are for national, uh, federal projects such as dams and this and that, but pork projects, 18 billion dollars. You cut 13 billion dollars uh, in foreign aid that were, were given to countries around the world that are adversarials of us. They're not friendly to us, but against us and we give them $13 billion. That's $31 billion right there. Then you can save $32 billion by just taking the appropriations budget back to the 2010 level. That's just two years ago. And you can save $32 more billion. Our country, our, our budget has grown so exponentially in the last few years that it's gone off the charts and we can get it back under control by doing some simple things. There's other things that we can do to cut the budget. If you eliminate the, the uh, 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 edu uh, Department of Education, except for a supervisor role, and give that money to the states. You should let the states implement, implement yes. the education program. They wanted to. We would save four and a half billion dollars just in administration costs. Uh, there are a number of things that you can do with that. Um, I, I, we can get into the, the uh, Social Security and Medicare and all those other things, but there's things that we can do um, that could cut the cost without uh, hurting uh, the seniors and the ones that desire. One, I believe we're going to have to raise the rates uh, when, we, when, uh, when we retire for Social Security, the age, I'm sorry, the age. Uh, because, I, and I'm not, I'm not in favor of beats test, so understand, I don't believe that people that paid into the system, but they were successful and earned a lot of money, should end up not getting those benefits they paid into. But when this, when this uh, Social Security was passed, uh, the life expectancy was 19 years less than it is now, but we've only moved it up two years from when they receive benefits. There has to be a program, uh, there has to be a grace period for people who have been relying upon Social Security, whatever, is five or ten years, but then you're going to have to move that age up some uh, to correlate with our increase uh, in, in the, in the uh, term of our lifespan and everything. Follow up question. Our current deficit is running $4 billion per day. Your thirty-two billion dollars of savings just took eight days. What are you going to do for the for the other uh, three hundred and sixty-seven days? It, it was actually sixty-three billion on those three projects alone. I used that number to get over fifty billion because that's what the federal government, that's what Congress has to agree upon before you fall off the fiscal cliff. There are a number of other areas, like I mentioned, the Department of Education. You can say four point five billion there. There's, a, I think, and I don't have these figures in front of me, but I went through the Freedom Works budget that they proposed, which, which was very enlightening. And they had a number of other areas where they were saving billions and billions of dollars, such as, uh, was it 18 billion? And, uh, it was 18 billion. You're going to hold me these numbers, I don't have them on top of it, but the tens of billions of dollars are given tax breaks for farm subsidies, for oil companies, for other types of industries that aren't provided, uh, uh, should be provided by our federal government. And, uh, and, and you're reaching, you know, whether it's another 50 billion or not a year. Um, I use that 50, that 62 billion example because that covers what the federal government should be doing not to fall off the fiscal cliff. Uh, we can go into more in depth details by just going over what I mentioned to you, some of those items in the Freedom Works Plan. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that, but they've done an extensive study on uh, some of the cost savings, some, most, of, most of which I agree with, some of them I don't. I'll get back to you in a second. Yes. What is your opinion of the agenda? <laughs> From what I understand of the Agenda 21, I'm certainly not in favor of it, and I think if, if it is accurate, we need to uh, make sure uh, that it's better informed to the public and uh, we get um, people in it that are going to fight against it. We have an issue, I believe, here in Nevada. I've only been in the last six months, so a lot of it's new to me, but I've been watching the, or reading about the Gold Butte uh, issue. That is, is an Agenda 21 project, and we need people to stand up against that. We're talking millions of acres of land that we can put into mm -hmm. conservation. Well, actually, it's gonna be, if it gets put into wilderness, you have no uh, ability to take a motorized vehicle, build anything, or do anything. I'm from like Montana. That. I understand. So, so I'm certainly against that. Yes. Yeah. In fact, Nevada has millions of acres that are already designated wilderness. 
uh, and Harry Reid is trying to get more and more done, and Gold Butte is one of those, and I will fight to stop that. Now, there's something that's even worse that I'll bring to your attention. You know, Yarrington has an 18% unemployment. That's not underemployment. Uh, that's unemployment. If you add underemployment, there's probably closer to 30%. It's in Harry Reid's uh, state, right? It's the third worst uh, unemployment rate in the whole country, you know, getting to the county. Where is it? Um, Yarrington and Lyon County. Lyon County, basically. Yarrington's in my district. There's a mine, Nevada Copper Mine, has put billions of dollars into producing a mine, and it's going to create jobs, revenues for the city, and all this stuff. They, they want what they made a proposal to go in and buy some BLM land at the fair market value. They're going to give more than half of it back to the city of Yarrington to build parks and other type of things that they're going to be able to use for the benefit of the city. There's no environmental concerns, there's no health issue concerns. It should be a no-brainer. Uh, Congressman Amaday introduced the bill, it was passed in the House. Harry Reid will not put it on the vote in the Senate because he wants the people of Yarrington to agree to, and, and it's debated how much it's going to be, whether it's hundreds of thousands or millions of more acres of wilderness uh, to protect the sage grouse up there. If they don't agree to that, he's holding them hostage and says he won't bring that vote up to the bill. And, and the Nevada Compromise will not be able to expand its, uh, its business to benefit everybody in that area. And that's what we're facing uh, on the other side. We're facing these type of tactics. You had another question that you wanted to ask me. How would you describe your tax policy? The tax policy is simple. I, I don't believe our tax system is fair. I think they're too complicated. I think too many uh, people and businesses get special breaks based upon their influence they have with <coughs> uh, legislators. I think we need to make the tax system fairer and, fairer and simpler. Uh, if, we're, or keep the, if we keep the same tax system, we need to cut down the vast majority of those deductions and just keep a few of them that are essential to what we're used to accustomed to, such as a home mortgage and so forth. I would be in favor of looking at the fair tax, which would eliminate the IRS completely and would be a, a national uh, 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 retail tax. There is a lot to explain when you go through that, but there, there is a level uh, that they protect the people who can't pay anything. Uh, so they, they, there's a level where they wouldn't be having to pay taxes. Uh, it makes everybody who's earning um, uh, money and buying a product to pay a tax, which we don't have right now. Even the flat tax would be a better product than where we have now. We eliminate all the deductions and have a flat tax for everybody else. What we have now is really quite simple how we got here, if you think about it. You have people that are in Washington. They're in Congress, and they want to stay in Congress. So what they say is, hey, and how do you stay in Congress? You get enough money to either scare off or run off your opponents or demonize them so that they can't beat your election. And how do they get that money? They get that money by meeting with different um, uh, PACs and lobbyists and so forth. And all of a sudden, we have a tax code that keeps expanding, 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 and have more and more tax breaks and deductions on it. Well, we've gone way out of, out of control. It's unfair to the average person, and it's wrong. You know what makes, makes me laugh? When I listen to the Democrats make a big issue about raising the tax rate from 36 to 39 percent, and they say that would be fair, you know, the, the, the more wealthier are paying that. And, hey, the, the, the people who have the money and are making that tax break, they got the best accountants. They're taking advantage of all these tax breaks and tax loopholes, and they're paying a lot less than that anyways. You could have it, you know, they talk about how it was in the 1940s and 50s at 70 and 85 percent tax break, but there were so many deductions that people that were at that level were paying such a lower amount. The key thing is everybody should be paying their fair share, and people that have more money, that have more influence with their congressmen and congresswomen and senators, should be getting the tax breaks that they currently are getting right now. And I'm going to go back to Washington fight very strongly for that. I think that's one of the biggest problems we're facing in our country. Yeah. Um, kind of two questions. The uh, the people in, in Washington, D.C. that are elected by us to serve the citizens of this country are not subject to the same rules, regulations, laws, and benefits that we are subject to, that they pass laws for us to be yeah. under. You have to explain why I get this question everywhere I go, and I'd be a very strong advocate to, uh, of the bill that I believe was introduced, or at least it was proposed, uh, to have Congress have to deal with the same laws they pass to their constituents uh, and dealing with health care, uh, retirement, and everything else. Yeah. 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 My follow-up is, what do you see yourself in regard to the number of terms you intend on spending in Washington, D.C.? John Adams didn't make the yeah, same no, I would be in favor of term limits and what those term limits would be. I'd like to see it uh, imposed across the board, uh, the voluntary one for me and nobody else. Uh, it doesn't do a whole lot of good for the people here in Nevada, but I would vote in favor of not even be a sponsor of a term limit bill. Uh, it would have to be staggered enough so that uh, 
you don't have this uh, big enough turnover that you would hurt national security and some other things. But you have professions you can come back to Las Vegas and do, mm -hmm. and so many of them, they're career politicians. They're, like Harry Reid, what the hell would Harry Reid do? What would be the best pomegranate? 16 years. <laughs> I mean, this is what's crawled through the $2 million time from Washington, D.C. I, I want to introduce Art and Kathy Lynn, and thank you guys for coming up here. They are uh, the chairman of the president. The president of the Grassroots Tea Party of Nevada, and Art is the vice president. They're we endorsed Danny, supported him in the primary, helped with the rural counties, and we endorse okay. and support him now. More, more than that, how wonderful these people are is they have been on the phone call, and, any, and if you listen to Kathy then talk, if she would, if she would support Borsford, I would have voted for him the way she talks. <laughs> she is so good. And her and Art put hours upon hours. They were at the uh, opening of the VA hospital with me today and made sure I had the right seat. They drove all the way up for this. This is this is what makes it worthwhile when you go out and you campaign and you're doing everything when you have people like them helping you. I'm sorry, I'll get to you in a second, too, but let me get to you. Go ahead. I find it interesting that when you listen to candidates on uh, what projects to cut and where they're going to cut the money, um, that it's, it, the cuts will come at the detriment of the American people, uh, whether it be the farmers, whether it be the Social Security, raising the age and so forth. And, and I understand those types of things have to happen, but what I don't hear is the billions and billions and billions of dollars in programs that the illegal aliens, yeah. uh, that the free medical, the, the all the different ways that they tap into our system without any rules, any sets of checks and balances. And I'd like to hear what you think about, do we even know how much money is being spent in Nevada or nationwide on illegal immigration mm -hmm. programs? Uh, when I ran two years ago, there was a number that was espoused and it was uh, mentioned several times. I can't think of what it was here in Nevada. It was quite high. You know, I, as I mentioned, in, I think my first question was uh, make, making sure only the people that are here in our country legally are entitled to the benefits provided to our citizens. I think that's what you're referring to. I've been, I've been ridiculed and attacked already by my opponent uh, for making that statement. Uh, he went in front of the, what they call the Hispanics and politics, a very left-wing group and criticized me for being an extreme radical because I made that statement. I think it's just more common sense. In fact, I said that today on the radio. I was on the Alan Stock Show. I said, you know, I, I don't try to, I don't come up with these um, far type of ideas. I listen to people, I listen to their ideas, and I see which ones. So how my dad was when he coached basketball. He'd sit there and listen to other coaches. He'd take a little bit here, a little bit there that he believed in, and he implemented them. So I just try to listen to other people. You understand stuff. These are common sense things we're talking about. We're not talking about anything crazy. If you're not in the country here legally, you're not entitled to the benefits provided to the citizens of our country. If that needs to change, then change INS laws and make it different for people to come in the country illegally. And I've been a strong advocate for that, and quite frankly, I've been attacked already on that. I'll get to you next. Yes, no, you probably already know, but there's a common sense filter at the Beltway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what about voter ID? When I ran for Secretary of State in 2006, I was the biggest advocate of the Carter Baker proposal. Carter, Jimmy Carter, of all people, made a proposal to Jimmy Baker. After the 2004 presidential election, they made a commission to look how you can improve the, the uh, voter, voter laws. And they said people should show a, uh, a proof of citizenship when they register to vote and a photo ID when they go to the polls. I uh, ran on that principle. Unfortunately, I didn't win. And in fact, the current Secretary of State has gone the complete opposite. It's unfortunate. 